Hi everyone, uh, welcome to virtual class. Uh, today I am going to be finishing up the Photoshop introduction and I'll do a little refresh for those who may have not been there. Um, and then we'll go into a discussion of color theory as well. Um, a few things. I'm going to uh, demonstrate Photoshop and you may notice that I have this green uh, goodie around my mouse and that's just so that you can see better what I'm doing and I'll try to th talk through key commands that I'm using as well. So I'm just going to do a quick refresh of the layout and tools that we went over in Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop nowadays looks a little bit like a web browser. If you look across the top uh, if you have an image open, it will show up as a tab across the top. I have five images open right now, so I have five tabs open. Over here on the right-hand side is the Layers panel. This is where you will build kind of a, a composite version of whatever uh, you're working on. So, for example, I can make a new layer, and I can take any tool. In this case, I've grabbed the paintbrush, and I can then paint on my image, these are lovely clouds, and I can paint on my image without actually harming the original image. This is called non-destructive editing. So I can turn this layer on and off using the eyeball button, and it has not affected my photo. If I'm unhappy with it, I can either grab the layer and drag it to the trash, or I can just make sure it's selected by being this kind of blue-gray color, and I can delete the layer altogether. So the layers panel is where you kind of build your photograph, so to speak. Uh, just a quick reminder about the selection tools that we used. Uh, I'm going to work my way from the top of the tools bar over here on the left to the bottom, at least mostly. This is the move tool. This is your main default tool. Um, right now it's not going to be doing too much for me because there's nothing to move, but we will see as I go that there's a lot uh, to be done with the move tool. The main feature that I covered in class was selections. We have a bunch of different selection tools here. Uh, some of them are kind of blunt instruments, like the marquee tool, um, which I can do any number of things with. Uh, I'm going to show you right now. I just unlocked this layer over here. I'm going to show you right now um, just having this basic selection. Uh, I can do all sorts of things. I can fill this with color. I'm going to hit the delete key, uh, and you'll actually see that I just cut a a hole in the actual image, which I probably don't want to do regularly. Um, a good practice with Photoshop is often to grab your layer and drag it to the new layer button down here, and you can actually make a copy of your um, original image. And if you're going to be doing destructive editing, meaning something like uh, painting right on the image layer or something like that, that way you can do it without ever harming your original photo if you should need to go back. So, for instance, if I grabbed my paintbrush, and I painted, and these are the brush controls up here on the left. When I have the brush selected, I can select the size with this slider and the hardness uh, or softness with this slider. I'm going to go 100% here. And this way I could do a destructive edit like this, and nothing bad would happen because I have this image layer now being affected. Notice that when I have a selection, meaning this flashing marquee tool, the only thing, uh, the only place where I can make a, a change to the image is within that selection circle. And if you see uh, how it kind of fades out here, that's because my selection is actually a soft edge selection, even though the line around it doesn't look that way. So as a reminder, and I'm just going to go up to select, deselect to make the marquee go away. As a reminder, when you're in any tool, up across the top here are a bunch of controls. And I have actually set up my marquee right now to be feathered, meaning it gradually transitions from full opacity to no opacity, and that's why we get this kind of fuzzy edge to my uh, selection where I painted, was because my marquee was set up to be feathered. Other selection tools, you can do different shapes of the marquee tool. Uh, there's the lasso tool, which is also kind of a blunt instrument, and in order to complete the selection, you have to come back to where you started. And now I could do any number of things here as well. Um, I'm going to start to show you other things other than just painting. In, under the image menu and adjustments, you can control all sorts of things. So I could um, get a simple brightness and contrast adjustment and bring up the brightness in her face so it pops up a little. But again, and I'll deselect that. Again, you can see that it's a kind of a blunt tool. Uh, I didn't get a very good selection right off the bat on her. And so we've got all this extra space that we probably don't want. Um, 
there are other shapes to the lasso tool. There's also the magnetic lasso tool, which uh, Photoshop will try to kind of guess the thing that you would like to select. It's easier if they're kind of sharper, more defined edges. So I was able to get that shape fairly well selected with the magnetic lasso tool. Another selection tool is the quick select tool. And the quick select tool is similar to the magnetic lasso in that it tries to guess what you're trying to select based on what's around that selection. So I'm going to come over here and change the brush size because every tool has kind of a size, or most tools have a size feature, and make it about the size of the thing that I would like to select, say this window, and then click and drag and try to select that. It's gone a little too far, which means Photoshop doesn't know the amount of difference I'm looking for. I'm going to deselect that, and uh, what I can do is make my brush size a little smaller, and that way it will only be looking in the area that I'm trying to select. And you can see that did a better job there. I can make multiple selections at one time by holding the Shift key and then using the tool again and again until I have the number of selections that I would like. And I can do this indefinitely until I'm happy with the selections, and then I can do whatever I want. Maybe it's um, adjusting the... Well, there's not much vibrance to adjust there, so let's go back to a brightness and contrast, and we'll just brighten up those areas. Not sure why I'd want to do that, but deselect it, and there you can see what I've done. One more thing about the selection tools. I'll go up here to this flowers JPEG, and I'm still in my crop tool, so let's undo that. Uh, the final selection tool will use the magic wand, and the magic wand is good at selecting similar color ranges. So I'm going to click in there, and it was set up pretty well to grab that whole petal. If it didn't, I might want to change my tolerance. For instance, if it was set to 4 on the tolerance, uh, it would only select a very tiny color range, like that. So I may want to increase the tolerance. I had it at 45. If I went too high with it, I might start to select too much more of the area than I want. For instance, if it's a similar color to a lot of them, uh, like that green, it's going to try to grab way too much of the image. So play around with the tolerance until you get the selection you want. Deselect that and start over again. And again, if you hold the shift key, you can make multiple selections. And keep adding to your selections until you're happy with what Photoshop is giving you. And then you can make adjustments based on that. You can also come up here to the Refine Edge button and make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. You can maybe smooth out that edge or feather it so it transitions into uh, the rest of the image. And then when you're happy with the edge, you then have that selection that you created. And now you can do things like image adjustments, hue and saturation, which we'll talk about in a minute with color. And you can actually kind of tweak that setting a little bit. And we can give ourselves maybe a purple flower. And play around until we have something that we feel like looks halfway realistic. It's going to be hard to come by. And there we have it. And if we deselect it, you can see what it looks like in the real world situation. So those are the selection and crop tools. Let's now talk about color, uh, and I'm going to demonstrate the foreground and background colors. So in Photoshop you have you always have two colors, kind of one that's ready to go right away and one that's on deck, so to speak, uh, the foreground color and the background color. So you can always have kind of two colors at the ready all the time. And to decide what that color is, just double click. Uh, actually, that was a single click on the color box here, the color chip. And you can either click around in this window. You can also just use the hue slider to change it that way. And if you happen to know certain RGB values uh, or any of these others, if you were getting into specific graphic design type stuff, you could just enter the number in to get the color that you wanted. Um, so I've just changed my foreground color to this lovely green, and now I can do all sorts of things with it. If you want to flip that around and be using this yellow color instead of the green, there's this 
flipper arrow right here. And now the yellow is my foreground color and the green is my background color. So when I start painting, if I start painting, um, the foreground color will now be the yellow and I can flip it back to get my green ready. And then we can make our smiley face picture, which everyone loves. So that is the foreground background color. If you want to change your foreground color, you can actually use the eyedropper tool here. And we can change our foreground color by picking something from the image. And you'll notice that my foreground color just changed. I could get two colors from the image by switching them and then getting the eyedropper tool and picking the next color that I wanted to have ready to go. If I forget about the eyedropper tool, I can actually get back to it by clicking on the chip. And when I hover over the image, it automatically gives me that eyedropper. And I can go find that color that I want. And now that is my foreground color as well. And again, I can paint with it or whatever I want. While we're here, we might as well cover another paint tool other than the paintbrush. Um, and that would be the paint bucket down here. And as you might expect, rather than using a brush, if you used a bucket, you get a bigger uh, blast of paint here. And so I've turned this entire layer um, into this tomato soup color, except for these areas. And the reason for that is the paint bucket paints into similar areas. So if I step backwards and undo that, and I hide our background image, what I mean by similar areas is all of this is empty space. And then we have the painted shapes here. If I were to click in one of the painted shapes, what the paint bucket would do is it would just try to fill that like area, that similar area to where you clicked. So it's just going to fill that smiley face shape. Had I clicked in the empty area, it's going to fill the entire empty area. So that's the paint bucket tool. Um, most of the time you don't want to color a whole layer, but if you have a selection, as we saw before, I'm just going to make a round shape here and you use the paint bucket, then you can fill in a large area really quickly without having to brush around a lot. So the paint bucket is useful. Uh, and we're also going to, in a little bit, get into the gradient tool. Uh, but basically, what you need to know about the gradient tool is that it lives in the menu of the paint bucket tool. And just very quickly, I'll get us a blank layer here. And the gradient tool um, can be set to a lot of different colors. Here it is set to transition from black to white. So this is what a black to white gradient looks like. I'm just going to click and drag. And out comes my gradient transition from black to white. Up here, like so many other tools, are all the uh, control features. And if I click on this swatch, it's taking me from the foreground color to the background. So I can get kind of a sunset look. And you can also change the shape of the gradient. Here's a circle. So it will go from center to the edges, starting with the foreground color and blending into the background color. Other gradient shapes, and you can constantly change these. You don't have to undo uh, or this interesting kind of geometric gradient that starts blurry and then gets hard line. I don't use that one a lot. Uh, a top and bottom gradient can be helpful sometimes. So we can just make these kind of uh, transitions on both sides. And then there's a star pattern, which is similar, but there you have the gradient tool. And also you can work with the opacity, so it doesn't necessarily have to be full opacity, but here, let's get rid of this and show you this kind of, let's go back to something a little more common sense which you could then lay over your image, and now it looks like a sunny day where the sun was coming back into the camera and flaring the lens. So that's the paint bucket tool. Now I want to talk about retouching. So let's go to the Fashion Spots JPEG, if you like. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different tools that you can use to fix things up uh, rather quickly. So if we come below the eyedropper tool, but above the paintbrush, we come to the healing brush menu. And right now I have the spot healing brush selected. There's also healing brush, patch tool, uh, red eye tool, all these things that can fix problematic photos. Zoom in here and see that she had a splotch on her leg that day, which you can actually tell I created in Photoshop, but we'll pretend it was there. And I'm going to select not the healing brush, but the spot healing brush, because there is just one little thing I want to get rid of. 
and get myself a brush that's about the same size, maybe a little bigger to the area. And what's going to happen is Photoshop's going to look around the outside of this spot and try to repair it based on what's around it. So I'll click and notice that it kind of missed some of it, so then I went back and drew around it. And it's a little bright still, but mostly it's repaired. I can play around with that a little bit more, try to blend it in until I'm happy with it. And if we get zoomed out, can't see it from the back of a galloping horse. Uh, so that same thing could be done on this spot over here. This is a little trickier because there's a transition area here. So if I just took the spot healing brush and I tried it again, it may do something weird to her sleeve here <laughs> and actually start to guess from all over the picture. So we'll need to be a little bit more careful here. And here's where we might want to use the regular healing brush and make it rather small and just chip away. And what it's asking for, the reason I got that little warning, is because with the regular healing brush, what I need to do is I need to tell it the area of the picture that it's borrowing from. For example, if I want to paint her sleeve back in, fix her sleeve, I need to hold the Option key. And when I get this little target, I need to say, here's the area that I want to replicate. And I'm going to then start to paint with the healing brush over. It's going to be hard to replicate that hard edge since I have a soft brush right now, but can kind of start to, as I said, chip away at it. And if you notice that little plus symbol, that's a target showing me where I'm currently borrowing from in the image. And so I can just kind of try to blend it in a little, but this is not working uh, particularly well. And then to do the same thing on her arm, I would select a similar setting and try to paint over it. You'll notice that it's still having a bit of a challenge and it's borrowing from some of the wrong areas of the, po of the photo. So I'm going to show you a different retouch tool that might handle this one a little bit better. And so I'll step back here for a minute. All right, so I'm going to show you now the clone tool, which works similarly to the healing brush in that you want to define an area to copy. Here, I'll copy this part of her shirt. I'm going to click the Option key, and again, I get this target and show Photoshop where I want to uh, borrow from. I'm going to change the, make my brush a little harder edge, and now I'll start to paint over that area that's trouble. And I'll just maybe borrow a little bit from down here so I get a slightly different tone. And we'll come back here. And I've started to go into the skull there, you might notice, so I'll need to go back and paint that out with a blacker area. We can see that it's starting to disappear, though. I'm going to make a smaller brush and do the same thing to this part that's on her skin. But you'll see that it's harder uh, because I've selected a darker part of her skin. So this is where I might want to use the healing brush and let Photoshop manipulate things a little bit rather than the clone tool. So you can see the kind of different approaches there. For something more subtle, the healing brush is often better than the clone tool. Clone tool is really good for areas uh, that are perhaps less subtle, but where you have patterns that have to repeat and things like that. So I'm going to grab the clone stamp here and try to get rid of this graffiti. And so what I'll do is I'll basically try to take this brick and replace it. And notice my target over there on the left, it's telling me where I'm borrowing from. Probably not wise to put two very similar bricks together, and also probably not wise to use such a hard-edged brush, but see what's kind of happening there. And maybe I could go borrow another brick, and I'll make my brush softer. And we'll grab this brick up here, an option click, and it'll start at that corner, so I can kind of paint up this other brick, and we start to get rid of the graffiti that way. And again, it may look a little crazy from up close, but if we get out of here, uh, we'll start to notice that it, from a distance looking at the whole picture, starts to look um, 
a little bit more like what we would hope it would. So those are good tools for retouching. I'd like to talk about modes now, the transfer modes. So I'm going to go up to this uh, image called Burger Joint and um, talk about interactions of different layers. Um, I, I touched on this briefly, and I'm going to make a new layer here. Um, and I'll go back to the gradient tool, since that's a fun one to play with. And just going to fill that layer with a gradient. My opacity was set to 31%. For the purposes of this demo, let's make it 100% and we'll just fill that layer up there. Um, over here in the layers panel you can select a few things. You can change the opacity of a given layer. So I'm gonna just for demo change it back to that 31 percent that we had before and that gets us back to what you saw that I did with the gradient when the opacity of the gradient was 31 but here I have a chance to do a little more uh, changes with it now. I could make it more or less opaque depending on the needs of the photograph. The other thing I can do is change the interaction of the layers, meaning how this layer behaves to the layer below it. Uh, and so I can change the way that the colors connect with the colors below, the colors and the tones below. And you'll see that these are organized in kind of families, similar families, to get different effects. And I can always change the opacity of that layer to get the effect that I want. So this is cool for color effects and things like that, but it can also really be helpful for fixing problems with photographs. I'm going to uh, delete this layer that I created, and what I'm actually going to do is duplicate the original photo layer so that I can change the interactions uh, between the two layers. So what I'm going to do is see if I can get rid of some of the glare in key subject areas so that uh, we can really see our character here. So I'm going to change this mode of the top photo to multiply. And that's a little intense, but it is going to help me kind of cut through some of the glare. If you'll notice, I'm kind of cut through the glare there. So what I'm going to do is I am going to not go quite so extreme with it. come to my quick selection tool and just see if Photoshop can I'm going to hold the shift key to add to the selection notice now I'm on the minus selection tool so I'm actually chipping back away at this image which is probably a little more extreme than I want to do. I don't want to be too perfect with this. So I'll select kind of this whole area here. Now I'm going to refine that edge. I like to have that kind of control. And so I will feather it out just a little bit and smooth it out just a little bit so it's not quite so jaggy. Um, and then I can shift the edge a bit too to grow it a little bit more than what I selected. Let's feather it some more, maybe a little too much, and now I'm happy, so I'll say okay. Now I have this nice selection made, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get rid of the rest of the layer that I don't need here because I'm really only trying to work on him. So I'm going to go to Select, Inverse, and now notice that it has the shape I drew around him, but this outside marquee, flashing marquee, and that tells me that now I've selected everything around, meaning outside of my selection. And I'm actually going to hit the delete key, and here I'll hide the bottom layer so you can see what happens. Uh, I hit the delete key, and now we just have this selection of the multiply layer done. And so what we've done is, if I take away my marquee a little bit, uh, we've made a selection. I'd like to go back and fix some of that. I'm not super happy with how that worked out. But I can now change kind of cutting through from the original, which would look like this, and kind of clearing out some of that haze by making it uh, 
by using the multiply feature. And if I wanted to fix up that edge at all, all I would have to do is make sure I have this layer selected and grab a tool like the eraser. Make sure it's a fairly mild eraser, meaning I'm going to start off at uh, not 100% flow. That just means that the, the tool uh, is less powerful. And I'm going to come in here, find the edge that I don't like, and with the eraser being on this layer, I'm just going to kind of trim away some of that dark edge that's around there. And I'm using a really soft brush and just going very gently. If I need to do more, I can come back because I have a partial flow set there. And I could just trim up that edge so I'm happier with it after the fact. So you can really see kind of the beauty of layers in Photoshop uh, and how they allow you to get really specific with an image. So I want to talk about the Dodge, Burn, and Sponge tool. Those can be found here. Uh, you may have this little lollipop looking thing. You might have a hand doing that, or you might have the sponge tool based on that. So these tools are kind of, they come from old darkroom days. And uh, the sponge would be something that you use to change color values if you think of yourself as kind of either sopping up colors or wiping them away. Um, the burn tool looks like a hand with a hole in it because it used to be in dark rooms if you uh, let light through in particular areas longer the negative would then print out darker on the positive so just to show you an example with the burn tool you can then uh, make things darker than they originally were for instance um, let's say we wanted this rope to be a little darker than it is what I would do is get myself a smaller brush and I'd have a relatively low exposure effect to start with, but we're just going to paint in here and make this rope darker than it was originally. We're not painting, we're just burning in, meaning we're exposing the image longer and making this particular part darker. By exposing, I don't mean like we would expose in a camera, more I mean it like in a darkroom setting. All right, so that's burning. And let me show you up here on an area that it might you might notice more up here on this antenna. And just to show you the difference, if I now turn this off and we go to the original, you can see how I've darkened those things up quite a bit. All right, so the opposite tool is the dodge tool. And dodge, we used to block out light when we were doing the printing from the negative to the positive. Uh, and so it's the opposite. You make things lighter than they originally were. And maybe I don't like that the fact that this boat is um, kind of painted two shades here, so what I might do is use that dodge tool to kind of lighten up just this one particular area. You can see it kind of starts to look fake pretty quickly. So I'm going to step backward here. And I will change my dodge tool, make it more gentle, and you can also select whether it works in just the shadow areas, the highlights, or the midtones. This is a midtone range here, the highlights being more the whites and the shadows being the darker areas. So I will stay in the midtones, just change my exposure, and I would just gradually work on this to try and get it to be less noticeable. So that's going to take some doing, as you can see. So that's the dodge tool. And then finally, the sponge tool. The sponge tool is a saturation effect, so meaning it can add more or less color depending on how it's set up. For this demo, I'm going to try to make the buoy that the boat is tied to either more or less saturated. And I've chosen a fairly softly, soft, fairly big brush. And so I can either and notice I have my flow set to 45%, so it's not going to all happen at once. Um, it's only a percentage of the effect. I can either set my sponge to desaturate, meaning take away color, and I'll just show you at 100% so you can see the effect right away. Um, I can start to take the color of the buoy down, so it's less saturated. Get the color out of there, and then just to show you the original versus the new, so maybe that's a little less distracting. Or, if I want to undo that.
I can go the opposite direction and switch the menu to saturate and I can make the buoy really vibrant and saturated. So there's the difference. All right, so now we're going to move back into the color theory section of things. And uh, so those are all the tools that I wanted to show you. And uh, now we're going to move on to the color theory section of the lecture.